I want to tell you a story today. And it's a story with a lesson. It's a lesson that I learned almost 60 years ago that has been part of my life ever since. It's a story that I've told here before at Riverbend, and you will remember it, because it's a story about a thing called the honey wagon. It's a story that takes place uh, when I was a young boy working on my grandfather's farm. I was six or seven years old, and, and uh, I, was, I was part of the daily routine of the farm, and my grandfather approached me and said, uh, Dave, I need your help with the honey wagon. Now, what I didn't understand at the time was that honey was a euphemism. The honey wagon was actually a John Deere manure spreader. And somewhat hilariously, people in the agricultural community had euphemistically called this compost made of cow manure and straw, they had called it honey. And so I got my introduction to the honey wagon thinking not that it was a manure spreader, but that it had something to do with bees. And so this lesson from the, the honey wagon is a lesson that has served to remind me of the, of the process of how God causes us to grow. In some sense, we've been talking about this for over two months. We've been in a study, a conversation on Sunday mornings based on two verses from the Apostle Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 5.22, we have been focusing on the agricultural spiritual product called the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, which manifests itself as joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But today we're going to talk about how we enhance or how God enhances the production of fruit in our lives through the introduction of honey. We're going to get all agricultural today. We're going to get horticulture. We're going to do some organic chemistry today. And we're going to talk about spiritual fertilization. But before we dig in, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, and that you would use your words spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to challenge us, to inspire us, to warn us, and to help us become more fruitful. Pray that for myself and for my family and for each of us here, for I ask that in Jesus' name, amen. I suppose that most of us, through by the time we finished elementary school, by the time we're in seventh or eighth grade, have been introduced to the concept of how plant life works on earth. We may not realize it or as sixth or seventh graders, but all of, all of the organic life that exists on this process, on this planet, depends on this one process. It is a process called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, very simply, is how plants are, or organisms containing the product chlorophyll are able to take light energy, combine it with water and carbon dioxide, and create it through a process that is virtually mysterious and miraculous, converted the, chem the light energy into chemical energy. And through that process, they not only create complex carbohydrates and sugars and glucose and the things that actually form the plant and the branches and the leaves and the fruit, it actually produces as a byproduct oxygen, which is how all human beings live and all animals live on this planet because we breathe in oxygen but our body produces carbon dioxide. Plants take carbon dioxide in, combine it with water and sunlight, and produce a healthy plant. It really is quite a miraculous process, and I think most of us, yes, are familiar 
with photosynthesis. Perhaps you never thought about going out and hugging a tree, but you ought to really thank them because they are the reason that we are alive. Trees and plants and grass and all kinds of organic features of this planet. Without them, life would cease to exist. And most of us understand this, but fewer of us understand how fertilizer works. The fertilization process of plants actually enhances the process of photosynthesis. And chemically what happens in the fertilization process, particularly with organic, animal-based, cow manure-like compost, that process produces three chemicals in the soil that enhance the photosynthesis in the plants and the growth of the plants. The first one is nitrogen. Nitrogen actually helps the plants to produce stronger cells. It, it creates those complex carbohydrates and sugars and glucose that, that strengthen the structure of the stems and the stalks and the trunks and the roots and the branches of the plants. The second uh, chemical that fertilizer, particularly organic cow manure fertilizer, introduces into the soil and into the plants is phosphorus. And phosphorus is an accelerant for the process of photosynthesis. It actually helps with the conversion of light energy into chemical energy. And the third, chem the third component, the third ingredient that comes from the cow manure into the plant is, nit is potassium. And potassium serves like an antibiotic and it protects the plant from disease and from harm. It, it kind of insulates the plant and helps it fight off bacteria. Now, it's interesting to me that, that these, the way that fertilizer works is just the same as the way the Apostle Paul describes a spiritual fertilization process in Galatians chapter 5. We're familiar with Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Hopefully you are. We've been talking about it for two months. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But what most of us aren't familiar with is the context of those two verses. We don't press on into verses 24, 25, and 26. But in verses 24, 25, and 26, the Apostle Paul gives us a spiritual formula for fertilizing the soil of our lives so it enriches the fruit that we produce. He says it like this in verse 25. He says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh along with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep up with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Oh boy, I'm going to needle point that and put that in my kitchen. These are not three verses that you, that you think of in terms of some kind of feel-good access to the promises of God. They are, in some sense, theological chemistry. This is, this is a spiritual shorthand for a process that takes place in us that, that enriches us so that the fruit of the Spirit can be produced. It begins in verse 24. In verse 24, the Apostle Paul says, those who belong to Christ, or belong to Christ Jesus, have crucified the flesh along with its passions and desires. Now, if you've never read that verse before, you read it like I read it, and it's like, uh, no. Um, I don't, what, and, and it starts right off. It picks a fight with everyone in the first phrase, those who belong to Christ. There have been theological knife fights going on for 2,000 years trying to explain what does that mean. Who is it that belongs to Christ Jesus? Because if you ask some group of people, they'll tell you, oh, I know who belongs to Christ Jesus. It's the Methodists. And other people will say, no, it's the Lutherans. And other people say, no, it's the Baptists. And some people will say, no, it's the Pentecostals. And a few really smart people will say, no, it's riverbenders. Other people will say, you know, what it means to belong to Christ means to, means to intimately follow him. 
Other people will say, no, it means to make a decision to make him the Lord of your life. Other people will say, well, it means that at one point in your life, you bowed your head and you closed your eyes and you raised your hands and you came down front and you made a public profession of faith. And, and people have been theologically arm wrestling over what does it mean to belong to Christ Jesus for 2,000 years. And of all of those things, I can tell you what the right one is. All of them. Plus one. You know what it means to belong to Christ? It's like my granddaughter belongs to me. Frankie belongs to me. She's part of me. Whether she knows it, understands it, believes it, or can comprehend it, she is, she is part of me. She belongs to me. She is the object of my affection, and she is, she is part of my life. She belongs to me, not in the sense of property, but I cannot imagine my life without her. And that is how God thinks of you. Whether you believe it or not, you are a child of God. Whether you accept that idea or not, whether you understand that idea, whether you think we are made in the Imago Dei or not, you are a child of God. You belong to Christ Jesus. And you want to know something amazing? So does everyone you meet. They belong to Christ Jesus too. And so right at the beginning, it begins with this promise. It begins with a promise that says you are a child of of God, believe it or not, you belong to Christ Jesus. But he says, since we belong to, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, that, that, that sounds really good in church, but that doesn't work in traffic. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work when my boss is an idiot. That doesn't work when my children are out of control. My flesh is very much alive and well. All of that stuff in me, all of that natural inclination, all of my weaknesses and all of my vulnerabilities. No, no, they, no, they have not been crucified. They are still alive and kicking. But here I have to get grammatical with you for a minute. I have to, we, have to, we have to look at this really closely to understand technically what he's saying. Remember, this is spiritual organic chemistry. And at the molecular level, at the grammatical level, the word for crucified, the word stauron, it's a verb. You can stauro, sarizo, you can crucify someone. In the, in the Greek language, in New Testament Greek, in the Koine Greek, there were, there were, ver, there were all the verbs had different tenses past, present, and future. They also have perfect and pluperfect and imperfect. And then there's a tense in the Greek language called the aorist tense, A-O-R-I-S-T. And when, to, when a word is, is written in the aorist tense, it's as if the author is making a very specific point about that word. He's saying, not so much that this happened in the past or it happened in the future. It's not really a, a measure of temporal existence. What it is, is it's a comment on the confidence of the certainty of that event. In the aorist tense, it simply emphasizes absolutely, positively, this took place. Your flesh has been crucified. And in a meta-narrative sense, you know what that means? You and I have been set free. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have had the flesh crucified. Your debt has been paid. Your guilt and your shame and your anxiety and your fear and all of the, all of the debts that you have in your life, those have been taken care of. It is the promise in which the, the soil of our life that enriches us, that produces fruit. It is the promise that we are no longer orphans, we are children of God, and we are no longer slaves because we have been set free. Whether you believe it or not, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh along with its passions and desires. I was talking to my wife, Diane. I don't know if you know my wife, Diane, but she's a stud. I mean, she just is. She's just like, 
miles ahead of me spiritually. And so, so I came home Monday, and I had had a day, a typical Monday. I had meetings all day. I hate meetings. So I was in meetings the whole day. I had barely any time to study. And when I was studying, I was studying organic chemistry because I was trying to figure out how fertilizer worked to see if this whole thing, this whole thing would work. And I spent Monday, and I got home. She said, how were your day? I said, oh, it was OK. And she said, said, what are you talking about on Sunday? I said, well, I'm talking about this weird passage, Galatians 5, 24, 25, and 26. And she looks at me, and she says, Galatians 5, 24? That's one of my favorite verses. I'm like, that's nobody's favorite verse. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh along with his passions and desires. Yippee, let's go. Let's build a church on Galatians 5, 24. No, it's one of my favorite verses. And I'm like, okay. And she says, she says, you know what the Greek words for passions and desires are? You have to realize what was happening in that moment. You see, I spent four years of my graduate education studying New Testament Greek. I'm, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm competent in the Greek language. I should have some basis for being able to, to deal with questions of, of the New Testament language. And so my wife says, you know what those words are in the Greek. And, the, and, and, and I should have been able to say, well, yeah, I know what they are. But I had no idea what they were, because I hadn't looked at the passage yet. I had been studying organic chemistry all day Monday. And so, so she says, you know what those Greek words were? And I said, who doesn't? <laughs> and she gave me this look. This is the look. Which, in, in, in the euphemistic language, is honey. Or bull honey. <laughs> and so then she tells me. She says that the words pathos and epithumia. I'm like, huh. And she says, you know what that means? I'm like, tell me. She says, well, pathos refers to those, those emotions, those surface emotions, the, the emotions of the daily life. The pathos is the, is the frustration we feel and the anger we feel and the anxiety we feel and the sorrow we feel. It's, 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 it's the day-to-day -day emotional reality of our existence. It's from which we get the word empathy. It is that connection we have with the emotions around us. Those, that's that's our, our pathos. But epithumia, that's, that's a whole different word. That's, that's the deep stuff. That's the stuff that, that, that we carry inside of us, the wounds from our childhood, the, the dysfunctions of our family, the tragedies and the traumas that, that life has inflicted on us. That's the, that's the epithumia. That's, that's the deeper stuff. You see, she has spent the last five years developing a curriculum of spiritual formation called Deeper Journey. And, and what, what she has become an expert in and what every woman and man who's gone through Deeper Journey has experienced is working through why do I feel the things I feel and how do I deal with the deeper wounds in my life? How do I deal with the pathos and the epithumia? And she said, that's one of my favorite verses. Because that says that those who belong to Christ Jesus have been set free and that we are free to investigate, why do I feel the things that I feel? I don't have to be imprisoned by, I don't have to be, I don't have to be compelled by, I am under no obligation to obey those, those traumas and those tragedies in my life. And she understood that, that promise that is, that is worked into the soil of our life, that produces in us the fruit of the Spirit, comes from this spiritual nitrogen that strengthens us because it's a promise that give, that's given to us that we are no longer orphans and we are no longer slaves and we are no longer obligated to be, to be imprisoned by or held hostage by the wounds and the struggles of our life. We are truly set free. And the fruit of the Spirit grows out of that soil. 
So the first ingredient of this spiritual fertilizer is a promise. The second ingredient of this spiritual fertilizer is an invitation. In verse 25 of Galatians chapter 5, it says, it says, since we are walked by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is code for an invitation to vulnerability. It's an invitation to intimacy. It's an invitation to feel all the feels. And that doesn't work for me at all. It does not work for Dave in the least. You see, I was raised an empiricist. I was raised a skeptic. I was raised a cynic. I was taught that if you cannot prove it, if you cannot make a case for it, then don't trust it. And the thing that you don't trust above all else is simply what you feel. And I was taught and I was raised and I was, I was brought up in a family where my emotions were untrustworthy. They were unreliable. Because if I, if I followed my emotions, I, 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 would lose my, I would lose control. And so it was much better to be a person who dominated their life by their, by their thoughts and by their actions, by their intellect. But you see, we're Trinitarian human beings. We are men and women who are fashioned in the image of God. And we are fashioned with a intellect, emotion, and will. And, it's, and you cannot be a holistic person and just function in your intellect and will you have to be able to feel. You have to take the risk. You have to be willing to keep in step with the Spirit. To be willing to let God surprise you because, because we live in a universe that is mysterious. We don't even know what we don't know. And the invitation in the spiritual fertilizer of Galatians chapter 5, verse 25 is an invitation to keep up with the Spirit, to, em to embrace and to enter in to an intimate relationship with the mystery. And this makes a person like Dave, this makes a person like me uncomfortable because it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to release. It's hard to step back and say, no, I'm, I'm just going to be fully present. I'm just going to fully immerse myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall into the arms of God. And I'm not going to worry, and I'm not going to fear, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to work it out. I'm going to trust, and I'm going to believe. And if that sounds ridiculous to you, it sounds impossible to me. But this is the invitation. And for those of us who have a hard time with this, it's, this is how we are whole. This is how we are fully present. When we're with people, it's not just to be physically present. It's not just to be mentally present. It's to be emotionally available. This is how we engage as holistic people, as healthy people. But there's a promise in here embedded in this invitation. It's in John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, I'm going to provide you with the Holy Spirit. And I like how the King James translates it. It translates the word parakaleos as, as the comforter. You know what the invitation is? The invitation is to know and be known, to see and be seen, to, fel to feel and be felt. Jesus' promise in John 14 is that I will not leave you comfortless. I will, I will put in your experience the affirmation that you are known and that you are seen and that you are felt. Because what you feel, I feel. What you're going through, I'm going through. It's an invitation to that wholeness. Spiritual fertilizer that produces the fruit of the spirit in our lives is, is that spiritual nitrogen. It's, it's, it's the promise that we are no longer orphans. We are no longer slaves. We are no longer obligated to obey our urges. And it's an invitation to be whole intellect, emotion, and will to feel all the feels and to be felt and loved. But it's the third one, the third one that's the hard one because it's a challenge, it's a warning, it's, it's difficult. He says, he says, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying 
each other. And this is, this is a chain reaction. It's a, it's, a, it's a set of three words, conceited, conceited and provoking and envying. One leads to the other. And it begins with conceit. And, and, and the idea of, of, of conceit is the idea of vain glory. You know what conceit is in, in, in the original language? is a very interesting word. It, it's uh, kenodoxa. And the word keno literally means empty. And doxa means glory. And so basically what the word means is empty glory. Is, is, is this hollow construct that's, that says, that says I'm, I'm going I'm to focus on, 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 on the outside, not the, the hollowness on the inside. Have you ever met someone who is, who is so self-absorbed, they, they had no connection, they had no self-awareness? You see, con- conceit as, as vainglory, as kenodoxa, can be self-pity as well as it can be pride. Because if I think I'm worthless, if I think I, I have nothing of value, I have empty glory, I, 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 I'm filled with self-loathing and self-pity. That's a form of conceit. It's an inverse form of pride. And then there's the person who believes that, that they have all the answers and that they have no needs. That's, that's vainglory. That's, that's kenodoxa. That's hollow. And this begins a process that, that destroys community and destroys families and destroys friendships and destroys relationships because that conceit leads to provoking others. The word provoke there is a, it's what's called in the Greek language, a hapax legomena. This is the only time it occurs in the New Testament. It's a word called prokaleo. It means to literally in front of speech. It's like speaking without thinking. It's like opening your mouth and not thinking about what you're saying. It is, it is, it is in, its, in its literal form, it is this idea of someone who comes up to you and says, I know you. I know you. And the reason they say that is because of your gender or your race or your beliefs or your, who you voted for, or, or the clothes you have on, or the car that you drive. How do you feel when someone comes up to you and says, says, says I, I, I know you without knowing you? It's a provocation, isn't it? I mean, we're seeing it in our culture all the time, where people speak without, without thinking, where, where people designate knowledge with, without any awareness. It's going on all around us. We're seeing this conceit that leads to provocation, that leads to this prokaleo, I speak without knowing. And then it leads to envy. And envy is the end of unity. The word is fratanos, and I'm not sure I'm saying it right, because it, it begins with a phi, which is ph, and then the next letter is theta, which is th. How do you say ph, th? Sounds like, like you need speech therapy for thranos. Well, this is the word, for thranos. And you, you know what for thranos means? Literally, it means to gaze intently at something. To be myopic. To say, it, to say my mind's made up. There's no changing it. I have this hollow view of you. I speak before I know you. I, 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 I am prejudiced and bigoted in my opinions, and my mind is made up. There's no changing it. Does it sound familiar? You see, this is a warning. This is the potassium that is injected into the, into the soil to say, don't be this. Don't be conceited, provoking one another and envying each other. Don't do that because it infects and it's toxic. In, in the community, it's toxic in your life. It is the spiritual potassium in the soil that creates the, creates the antibiotic that protects the fruit. So how do we do it? The Bible is full of advice on how to do it. It's like Proverbs chapter 3, which basically says, 
don't think more highly of yourself than you should. But fear the Lord. Because this is a healthy way to do it. Romans chapter 12 is Paul gives us sort of a, uh, he holds our hand through how to fight off this process of, of conceit and provoking and envy. He says, bless those who bless you and, and bless those who, pro- who persecute you. Mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but, but associate with those of low esteem. And then he says, do not be conceited. Don't let the seed of conceit, don't let the bacteria of it into your life. Don't have that hollow glory, that false opinion of yourself or of others. It was mentioned a couple of times in the last couple of months. The first time I heard it mentioned was on a Wednesday night. About a month ago, Pastor Thiago Duzzi, he's our out, one of our outreach directors and one of the most godly and, and, and just lovable human beings you will ever meet. He was teaching on Wednesday night, and he talked about how, how plants don't groan. You don't walk into a forest and hear the fruit trees going, ah, oh, oh, I'm working on fruit here. Ah. They, just, they, they just don't. I mean, you may hear them struggle against the wind or, or, or creak and groan, but, but they, they, don't, they don't complain about making the fruit. The fruit just happens. And then maybe you remember two weeks ago when Dr. Alan Hilton was up here and, and he did this pantomime of the calisthenics that a fruit tree goes through before it produces fruit, which I thought was brilliant and hilarious, because I never thought I'd see a Yale theology professor embarrassing himself by doing calisthenics and push-ups on the Riverbend stage, but there it was, and it was irony. He was saying, trees don't do this. Plants don't do this. They just produce the fruit. It is a byproduct of their existence, and so is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit happens because we are connected to the tree, because we are connected to the vine, because we are planted in the soil. And the byproduct of that relationship is the fruit of the Spirit. It just happens. How do I know that's true? It's the end of verse 23. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then how does verse 23 end? Against such things there is no law. You know what that means? That means I can't make you love me. Wouldn't it be great if I could pass a law that says everyone who comes to Riverbend is legally obligated to love Dave? That would be so awesome. Because most of you would go, I'm out. (laughs) No. You cannot legislate love. You can't even do it with your own children. Can you imagine a bureaucrat who introduces a law into into state government that says, by law, we will love each other? It's a great idea. It's impossible. Why? Because there is no law that that can produce love, and there's no law that can prohibit it. You cannot outlaw my love for Frankie. You cannot outlaw a mother's love for their child. You cannot outlaw true love. You cannot legislate it, and you cannot limit it. It exists because it exists in us. This is, this is why the fertilizer is so important. This is why the soil that we are planted in, the the roots that we are connected to, are so significant. Because if we plant them in the roots of, of the promise of God, and we plant them in the roots of the invitation of intimacy and wholeness and fullness with God, and, and we understand the danger of, of the bacteria of conceit and provocation and envy, it will produce in us healthier fruit. It's how fertilizer works. It's organic chemistry 101. You put the fertilizer on the soil, you stir it in, and and the nutrients, the chemical reactions, the nitrogen and, and the phosphorus and the potassium go up into the plants, and they strengthen the plant, and they produce the fruit. 
It's how it's intended to work. We're to connect with and, and fertilize the soil. As far as I know, my grandfather didn't know this. My grandfather never went to school beyond sixth grade. He never had a class in organic chemistry. He never, he never, I'm certain, he, he may not have even known what photosynthesis was. He didn't have to. He was a dairy farmer. By the time he was eight years old or five years old, he knew he was going to be a dairy farmer because his father was a dairy farmer. And his father before him was a dairy father, farmer. And his father before him after the Revolutionary War was a dairy farmer. He was going to be a dairy farmer. It was his legacy. It was his destiny. And his education came in the cold fields of the spring as he was plowing, preparing the fields for planting. It came in the heat of the summer when he was harvesting the crops that had grown throughout that season. His graduate education, his PhD came at 4.15 every morning, seven days a week, 365 year, days a year at the business end of a dairy cow. So he may not have understood why fertilizer worked, he just knew it did. And frankly, throughout human history, for thousands of years, people have thrown animal, animal refuse onto their fields knowing that it improved the yield of the crop. And so that's what my grandfather invited me to do. We were at dinner one spring morning, one spring evening, and he said, Dave, tomorrow I'm going to get you up early and you're going to help us with the honey wagon. And I was like, cool. I like honey. Who doesn't like honey? I didn't know we kept bees, but I'm all in. Get me up. And my grandfather woke me up at oh dark 30 the next morning, got me out, got me on the tractor, and we went out behind the barn to the equipment shed, and he opened the doors, and there it was, the honey wagon. And it wasn't this pristine, beautiful, green John Deere tractor trailer uh, machine, it, it looked like it was covered in French onion soup. Kind of like goo running down the sides of it. It had 20 years of manure like caked on to it. And he said, here it is, the honey wagon. And I'm like, oh. And so we hook it up and we go down and sure enough, we drive down to the dairy barn and we're pitchforking in this lovely honey you know, this compost of cow manure and straw and of who knows what. And we're throwing it into the wagon. We get the wagon loaded up. And he goes, okay, Dave, get in. And I'm like, get what? He's like, get in the wagon. And um, I didn't understand. What I didn't realize was the, the John Deere manure spreader had this, had this feature where there were gears that were attached to the wheels. And as the wheels turned, it had a blade that pushed push the manure into the, into the spreader, but that was broken. And so I was going to be the one who pushed the manure into the spreader. So he handed me an iron rake, and I'm standing knee deep in honey. And we head out into the field, and I don't know if you're familiar with the, how, how a manure spreader works, but it's not a precise machine. Basically, it has these tines on the back of it, and they grab a hold of, of, the, of the compost, and they throw it in the air, like 20 or 30 feet. And most of it goes to the back, and some of it goes to the sides, and some of it comes back to the front. So for the next two hours, I'm standing there with an iron rake, pushing this manure into the thing, standing in a hailstorm, of honey. In that moment, there was something that I knew with a clarity that I have never forgotten. I knew it as certain as my life on earth existed. I was never going to be a farmer. <laughs> that was not happening. No farming life for me. I didn't care if I was, had to go to school the rest of my life. I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna be a brain surgeon, or I was gonna be an astronaut, or I was gonna be a truck driver. I was not gonna be a farmer. And so, so the day finished, and and the months went by, and in late August, like six months later, we're sitting at the dining room table, and I'm eating the best corn on earth. Don't know if you've ever had it. It's technically called Silver Queen. It's a white 
Pennsylvania sweet corn. And when I say it's white, it's not that yellow crap that we eat everywhere else. It is white, like bleach white. And it is as sweet as honey. And at seven years old, I could plow through a dozen of those ears at one sitting, and that's what I was doing. I was sitting at the dinner table, and I was eating that silver queen, that, that white sweet corn, and I was going for my baker's dozen. You know what a baker's dozen is? That's 13 ears. And I think I had ear number 13 in my mouth, and I was like, ooh, this is, ah, this is the best food ever. When my grandfather said, said, Dave. I'm like, yeah, Grandpa. He says, remember the honey wagon? And I kind of went like this. Ugh. Tastes good, doesn't it, Dave? <laughs> kind of threw up a little bit in my mouth. <laughs> and I remembered the hailstorm of honey. I remember this, the whole experience. And then my grandfather said something to me that I have never forgotten. And it has served me well in some of the most difficult days of my life. It has seen me through some of the greatest challenges and some of, the most, some of the greatest discouragements. It was a fertilizer for my soul. <coughs> he looked at me and he said, yeah, Dave, remember this. The deeper the honey, the sweeter the corn. <laughs>